I'll start. Maybe I'll start you off with this. It, it certainly seems that the primary case driving Mr. Sato's argument would be Alvarez. Yeah, guys. So this is the first time in weeks since Fannie Willis uh, has been in the courtroom. And uh, basically right now, Donald Trump's team is working on uh, getting this uh, essentially Fannie Willis's Georgia election case against Donald Trump completely dismissed. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So this is a big uh, this is a big case taking place right now. In fact, this testimony, this this uh, this litigation taking place right now uh, could literally get this entire case dismissed. Um, we're hearing from uh, Steve Sadow, Trump's lawyer. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Uh, we're hearing from Steve Sadow, Trump's lawyer right now. And uh, he's making his case to judge uh, Scott McAfee right now. But essentially, uh, prosecutors, they're accusing Donald Trump's legal team um, of attempting to rewrite the indictment in their efforts to have this Georgia election case dismissed. And ultimately, this case today, um, which literally just wrapped up here just a few minutes ago, um, it, it marks the first hearing since um, a failed attempt to disqualify prosecutor D.A. Fannie Willis. But Steve Sadal, he's he's a fighter. He's just like Donald Trump. He's not going to quit. He's going to get D.A. Fannie Willis disqualified. He's going to get this case dismissed. Um, but Trump's lawyers, Steve Sadal uh, and, and company, they're arguing that his 2020 election comments, um, which challenged the election results, they represent a, a form of a political speech that is fundamentally protected by the First Amendment, you know, and, and so during a, a hearing in uh, a Fulton County courtroom, Trump's attorney, Steve Sadow, emphasized to Judge Scott McAfee that all forms of speech related to campaigning and elections, they're highly protected and basically is asserting that even if Trump's statements were untrue, they should still be protected uh, because they should be considered as a part of a significant part of <clears throat> public dialogue and therefore should be kind of shielded against D.A. Fannie Willis's argument and uh, legal repercussions. But take a listen. 106, 114, 128, 138 and 139. So the majority of the overt acts involve false statements or tweets which are clearly political speech how best to deal with that under the circumstances to prosecute those under a broad rico charge supposedly with uh, contesting a election by i guess illegitimate speech or expressive conduct or is the way that we are set up as a country is that the first amendment plays through this by others, by those that are complaining that it's false, proving it's false, bringing forth the truth. That's the essence of what Alvarez has said. That's the essence of what um, a case called Brown versus Hartledge, which is cited in Alvarez, 456 U.S. 45 at 61, a 1982 decision. All of those speak in terms of when you're dealing with that speech, that political speech, your best to deal with it through the pushing forth a counter view of truth, not not prosecuting the speech maker or the person that is articulating his political views. Uh, here we've, we've done just the opposite. Uh, we have decided that because those views were unpopular and in state's opinion false, we must prosecute them to stop them from happening again, which is, again, the essence of why it's unconstitutional as applied because that's not what the law says finally the rest of the overt acts either telephone calls or meetings or requests no false statements they're just acts expressive acts and they're in there as well those are political acts and for the court's benefit because i know there's a lot of overt acts those are 9 14 19 28 30 31 40 42, 43, 44, 90, 95, 112, uh, what was in the old indictment is 123, paragraph or number two is now I think is 125, 130, 131, 140, and 156. 
There is nothing alleged factually against President Trump that is not political speech. So what this court has to decide is, is the state's position that fraud or false statements under these circumstances, which I suggest really is alone, is that enough um, to get it by an as-applied challenge? Our position is it's not. Is there another way to look at this? They're going to argue at the same time that it's integral to criminal conduct. But it's the speech that's being punished. That is the criminal conduct. If it's not the criminal conduct, there would never be an indictment for the RICO against President Trump or any of these other counts. Take out the political speech, no criminal charges. Political speech uh, disagreed with, basis for all charges. Uh, I, I think that is the best way for me to sum up where our position is. All right. Thank you, Mr. Sadow. All right, Mr. Wakeford or Mr. Floyd, if, if there are any points that you wanted to address or respond to. Um, I mean, I so the hearing in Fulton County, Georgia, I mean, this like really kind of represents like the first court appearance uh, for, for the parties that are involved here, uh, President Trump, uh, uh, Fannie Willis, and uh, essentially, you know, this is the first court appearance since an unsuccessful attempt to disqualify District Attorney Fannie Willis a couple weeks ago. Now, Donald Trump and several co-defendants, they were granted permission to appeal this decision against Fannie Willis's disqualification. Now, Trump, who um, who, who actually didn't appear uh, in, in this hearing today, uh, but Fannie Willis was there, um, and 18 others, they had previously uh, pleaded not guilty to charges in a comprehensive uh, ra racketeering uh, indictment, uh, which actually accuses them of trying to overturn this 2020 presidential election result for Georgia. But after their plea for the de defendants, they actually accepted plea deals in, in return for their uh, agreements to testify against the other. So basically, if you just look like if you stab everyone else in the back, we'll give you guys a pass, basically. Um, but basically, Judge Scott McAfee recently dismissed six counts against Trump, which we covered, and uh, his co-defendants related to soliciting a, a public officer's oath due to a flaw in the indictment. So basically, Fannie Willis's office screwed that one up and that got six charges thrown out. What we're working on, what uh, Steve Sadow right now is working on is basically getting the entire case dismissed this today. Um, but the hearing was convened due to, you know, to be able to discuss three different motions from uh, Trump and uh, co-defendant uh, David Schaefer's attorneys aiming to get the indictment just completely dismissed. So Donald Trump's legal team is arguing right now that uh, that Donald Trump's arguments or actions surrounding the 2020 elections, they are protected actions by the First Amendment. And so basically their whole argument is leaning on the protection of the First Amendment to invalidate the, the, the indictment that is being presented. And well, I'll start, maybe I'll start you off with this. It, it certainly seems that the primary case driving Mr. Sato's argument would be Alvarez. And, you know, because that's a fractured kind of plurality opinion, I'm wondering if if you have any thoughts on just how much that can drive this. And I know the state back in December was also citing Alvarez as the primary case. I wonder if that's even the best one well, for your arguments. I think um, to address the first, I think, elephant in this courtroom um, is that a, uh, a Judge Chatkin in D.C. has evaluated all of these arguments uh, under Supreme Court precedent already. Um, so I would refer, Your Honor, to that court's analysis because I'm hardly going to uh, improve upon the findings of a federal judge. However, um, speaking specifically to Alvarez, the, the, it is a plurality opinion with uh, several different concurring, several, several different opinions written by other justices. What they all agree on, though, is that Alvarez doesn't change the law that speech integral to criminal conduct is not protected under the First Amendment, and that that's not what Alvarez was about. It was about punishing falsity for its own sake. So the question is, is that what the state is doing here? And by fundamentally rewriting the indictment, um, the defendant is suggesting today that that is somehow what the state is doing, when actually what the state is saying is that these statements made by the defendant were all employed as part of criminal activity, various conspiracies, frauds, 
intentions with deceit and violations of the law. It's not just that they were false. It's not that the defendant has been hauled into a courtroom because the prosecution doesn't like what he said. He is free to say, to say, to make statements and to file lawsuits and to make other legitimate protests. What he is not allowed to do is employ his speech and his expression and his statements as part of a criminal conspiracy to violate Georgia's RICO statute, to impersonate public officers, to file false documents, and to, to make false statements to the government. That's what he's alleged to do. It's never, it's, he's not charged under 161020 because he told some lies. Um, although it is very interesting to hear counsel for, the, for Mr. Trump uh, tell us about the usefulness of lies. He's not being prosecuted for lying. He's being prosecuted for lying to the government, a state, uh, an act which is illegal because it does harm to the government. That's the reason that it's illegal. That's why it's different from the statute evaluated in Alvarez. Same thing with filing a false document. It's not just that you, you made a false statement. It's that you swore to it in a court document and submitted it to the court. That does harm to the judicial system. That's obviously different from just falsity being punished for its own sake. And that is what each and every charge in the indictment demonstrates, is that these statements are part of criminal conduct that is larger than just the false statement on its own. Especially with the RICO charge, where what we see is that this is a, a, a criminal organization whose members and associates engaged in various criminal activities, including but not limited to false statements and writings, impersonating a public officer, forgery, filing false documents, influencing witnesses, computer theft, computer trespass, and on and on and on. What, what the defendant is suggesting to your honor is, is trying to get around to the fact that because it's, it's almost saying that because these statements are false, that these charges should be dismissed. It's, it's like, well, we, you can't punish falsity on its own, and yet each time you look at the charge, the government's saying, the state is saying that he lied. So that must be the, the end of the inquiry. But that's not the end of the inquiry at all. That's not what the indictment says. It's not just that he lied over and over and over again as counsel for the defendant points out by listing all of the instances in the indictment, is that each of those was employed as part of criminal activity with criminal intentions. And we finally get to a place where, it's, it, it's, it, where I knew we would end up, which is saying, I believe your honor was requested to think about it as, not as lies, but as legitimate concern about election issues. Well, that sounds like a trial argument to me. But this is why I began by talking about intent with your honor, because I knew we were going to end up in this exact place where he said, sure, you can look at them as lies because they weren't true, or you could think this is just well-intentioned concerns from an American citizen speaking his mind. And that, of course, would probably be a pretty good argument to put before a jury, and I expect we will see it, but it's not a basis for dismissing the indictment. The whole question of intent is, is no doubt going to be brought up. It can only be determined by a jury. But what we have heard here today is an attempt to rewrite the indictment, to take out the parts that are inconvenient and only say, well, it's all speech, it's all talking. And he was just a guy asking questions. <laughs> and not someone who was part of an overarching criminal conspiracy trying to overturn election results for an election he did not win by violating the RICO statute, by making false statements to the government, by filing false documents, by impersonating officers, and doing a whole host of other activity which is harmful in addition to the falsity of the statements employed to make them happen. So I think there's been a suggestion that Your Honor can sort of reframe what you're looking at, but Alvarez does nothing to shift the basis that the court should stand upon when evaluating so essentially what's happening here is uh, Fannie Willis's attorney is uh, attempting to overthrow the argument from Donald Trump's attorney, um, uh, Steve Sadow, uh, and, and basically say that, you know, hey, the grounds for which Steve Sadow's arguments are based on are not valid enough to be able to dismiss this case. So in a nutshell, that's what he's saying, and he's citing examples here. So let's go ahead and get back to it. And then Trump. All right. Thank you, Mr. Floyd. All right, Mr. Sid, I'll give you a couple minutes. Uh, final word. Thank you, sir. If I heard what Mr. Floyd just said, that if everything President Trump 
said was assumed true and included in the RICO indictment. And therefore, now we're talking about true political speech, not alleged false. He could still be prosecuted for the violation of RICO. For the overt acts as alleged. Let's say even the overt acts um, ran afoul of the First Amendment. He's saying that wouldn't be fatal to count one. Because at that point, if, if they... If there the could be over- some other thing they prove that's not alleged as an overt act. Okay. That, that may as, be, as I understand it. As, as I understood it as well. But what I'm suggesting is, if all of the overt acts are nothing more than core political speech or expressive conduct, and nothing else is alleged which is not protected by the First Amendment, then you have an insufficient basis for which he has been indicted, because he's being indicted for First Amendment uh, speech and not for unprotected speech. And therefore, the statement that was made about if it were true, we could still use it as an overt act, uh, suggests that they can prosecute (coughs) true speech. Um, which is what we're trying to get to here. It's the nature of the speech, the political speech, the heightened value of such, which gets this situation different than others, and the fact that it comes from then-President of the United States. Uh, Going back to what was said in addition by the state, what the state claims is criminal here is lying to the government. That's what it said. That's the exact reason why in several of the Supreme Court cases, it's been found to be protected speech because it deals with the government and falsity in the in sense of communication uh, with or to the government is best dealt with through true speech, not through prosecutions, in, because prosecutions chill speech. And when it comes to political core speech, what you don't want is chilled. Uh, I use, uh, fortunately, I have a a co-counsel that is able to pull things up and and help me inform the court uh, until the computer shuts down. Uh, And looking at what Haley says, just to give you an idea of how the Georgia court, the Supreme Court, might look at this. There's a quote from Haley, and it says, While there is no constitutional value in false statements of fact, such erroneous statements are nevertheless inevitable in free debate, and punishment of error runs the risk of inducing a cautious and restrictive exercise of the constitutionally guaranteed freedoms of speech and press. Accordingly, the First Amendment requires that we protect some falsehood in order to protect speech that matters. And I think that's what we're talking about here. To end this, and again, we're focusing on um, President Trump's conduct at, at the time that he, in fact, is the head of the executive branch. Uh-uh. There is references to this in Brown v. Hartledge, and I cited that earlier. A well-publicized yet bogus complaint on Election Eve raises the concerns that is raises the concerns that you may have some impact that would affect an election. Uh, But the preferred First Amendment remedy of more speech, not enforced silence, has special force. Uh, Underlying our dependence upon more speech is the presupposition the right conclusions are more likely to be gathered out of a multitude of tongues than through any kind of authoritative selection. To many, this is and always will be folly, but we have staked upon it all. And for speech concerning public affairs is more than self-expression. It is the essence of self-government. And that comes from Garrison v. Louisiana, which is cited also in Alvarez. Well, guys, so Trump's lawyer, Steve Sadow, has essentially filed an argument stating that President Trump's actions are subject, uh, which are subject to the indictment, they're protected under the First Amendment. And he's citing previous law instances where it has been supported. And essentially, Trump's, uh, the the allegations against Trump are falling under, under these protections, according to Steve Sadow. So, I mean, it's it's a very strong argument that he's presenting. And uh, I don't know, I, I, I think that this case ends up getting dismissed if we have a fair judge. 
Uh, I think Fannie Willis will have to end up kind of, you know, backing down on this one. If not being, uh, if, if she's not disqualified before then, uh, this argument really kind of just kind of like, uh, it, it essentially like, like posts that the indictment unlawfully is targeting Trump's political speech and his activities, which would be protected as core elements of the First Amendment. So this basically includes every charge, every action mentioned in the indictment, all of which, according to Steve Sado's filing, are basically they're 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 central to political speech. And so, you know, um, then, of course, you got uh, attorneys for David Schaefer, the former chair of the Republican Party. Uh, they plan to present arguments based on, um, you know, what they think is uh, flaws in the indictments. So there's a dish. There's so many holes in this indictment against Donald Trump. It's ridiculous. In fact, I mean, they're even they even assert that Schaefer was merely following legal advice when he organized so-called fake electors, as they call them, in the aftermath of the 2020 uh, presidential election. So Schaefer's legal team. They're also looking to have several phrases that they deem to be, um, as they say, conclusive, conclusory legal assertions removed from the indictment. There's not going to be anything left to this indictment. So <laughs> I, I'm a little, you know, I, I'm not trying to jump the gun here, but I think that this whole thing gets thrown out. Let me know what you guys think. Drop me some comments down below. Uh, I don't think it gets thrown out overnight. There's going to be some back and forth. I'll continue to keep you guys updated like, you know, I always do. Uh, if you appreciate the updates, hit the like button, subscribe, share this video on Facebook and Twitter. I'll see you guys on the next one.